Thank you very much, Dr. Hirschfeld. Thank you to the BBRF. I, I'm absolutely humbled to be able to share the Lieber Award with my friend and colleague, Steve Martyr. Uh, so as Dr. Hirschfeld mentioned, I'll be talking about social processing in schizophrenia. And you can think of the work of our team as being focused on one big question. Uh, and the question is, why is uh, functioning in schizophrenia not better than it is? Why is it disappointing? As a group, uh, people with schizophrenia don't do as well in terms of friends and family and jobs. And in order to address this big question, which is what we've been pursuing really for decades, we have to break it into some smaller questions. And so the smaller questions would include, uh, what are the determinants of functioning? Like, what, what, what influences how somebody functions in daily life? What are the bases in the brain for these determinants? How do we understand it at the level of brain processes? And what can we do about them? How can we intervene? How can we make them better? So, um, as Dr. Hirschfeld mentioned, there's going to be four presentations from our research team at UCLA, and we'll be tackling this question from uh, different angles. The first two presentations will be on understanding the brain bases for these determinants. And so I'll talk about the brain systems for social processing, and then Amanda McCleary will talk about the neural basis of learning and memory. After that, There'll be two presentations, one from Steve Martin, and one in Bill Duran, uh, on uh, combining drug and training interventions from Steve and development of a novel training intervention for social cognition that's coming from Bill. So this essentially is the outline of the UCLA component of today's program. Now, when you think about community function, you can think about family connections, social connections. You can also think about uh, what helps individuals with work or productive activities or school. And the question is, what are, what's going into influencing this? Today we'll talk about two of them. We'll talk about cognition and social cognition. Uh, we could have talked about motivation, but we'll focus uh, our discussions based on the amount of time we have. So I'll talk about social cognition. Amanda, uh, Amanda McCleary will talk about cognition, and then uh, Steve and Bill will talk about how we can intervene to make these better. In terms of my presentation, I'm just going to do a few things. First of all, I'm going to talk about what are the systems that we need to navigate our social world. How, how do the brain systems operate to enable us to get through a social maze that we go through every day? Secondly, and I'll give you some examples of some of these systems, and I'll tell you what they do and where they are. What's notable is that when you study the systems, some of them are impaired in schizophrenia, some of them aren't. So there are areas of intact functioning, and that's important. That means there might be areas to latch onto and to build training programs on. Finally, you can say what happens when these systems work together, and you can achieve something bigger than any one system, you can achieve something complex like empathy. So we'll start with um, looking at these systems. These are the four systems that uh, we focused on as being relevant to schizophrenia, social cue perception, mentalizing, experience and management of emotion, and experience sharing. I understand that these terms don't mean, I'm just trying to figure out what I did to do that. Um, uh, that these terms uh, don't mean anything yet, but I will be defining them. Uh, they have sub-processes. For example, social cue perception breaks into voices and, uh, and faces. Uh, regulation can be separated from experience, and then there's two components of experience sharing. As mentioned, some of these are impaired and some of these are intact. And since this is way too much to talk about in a brief presentation, we'll focus on four of the areas. Uh, and I'll be defining them as we go. So let's go ahead uh, and start with the first of these areas, which is social cue perception. And this is the system that enables us to identify social cues in our environment. 
and in, it enables us to pick up cues. And it, most commonly, we pick up things like emotion and faces. But you can pick up emotion from voice tone and intonation. You can pick up emotion from gestures, from posture, from gait. Um, but these are the two that have been studied the most. And people with schizophrenia show impairment on measures of these, uh, both in terms of face and voice. Now, if you want to get a sense as to what face emotion processing is like or how you measure it, you might consider the situation of Little Red Riding Hood because she looks scared. She looks scared even though she's not displaying prototypic facial expression of fear. She looks scared because she has subtle versions of that and she's a good actress. When you came here today, you came to the Kaufman Music Center, you saw a room full of people and you walked until you found some faces that you could identify and you could identify the emotion in those faces. You did it rather effortlessly. So you can imagine that if that was hard to do, it would be difficult to read emotional cues in one's environment. These are the brain regions that are associated with processing social cues, and they include uh, regions in, such as the fusiform and the amygdala uh, that get commonly looked at with face processing. There's now a lot of studies uh, in using functional MRI or fMRI, it's activation tasks in a scanner, and you can uh, determine how the brain activates using fMRI. And across a large number of studies, there's indications that people with schizophrenia don't activate the amygdala or the fusiform, these regions, as much when they see an emotional face compared to a neutral face. So this is a very consistent finding. You can also look at EEG. This is a meta-analysis done by Amanda McCleary. He'll be speaking next. Uh, you have, whether you know it or not, a wave, an EEG wave, uh, it's called an event-related potential, that's specific to processing faces. And if you look at the amplitude of that wave, what you'd see is that, on average, uh, people with schizophrenia have a lower amplitude for that wave than control individuals. So uh, we see now in terms of performance, in terms of EEG, in terms of fMRI, that there are differences between comparison groups and schizophrenia when it comes to social cue perception. What about experience sharing? This is one of the weirdest things about how we operate. When we see someone move, part of our brain activates as if we ourselves are moving. When we see someone expressing emotion, part of our brains activate as we ourselves are expressing the same emotion. So when that happens for movement, it's called motor resonance. When my brain activates, when I see someone move, that's called motor resonance. When it happens with mood, it's called affect sharing. And affect sharing is really automatic. So when you see someone like this, you just feel oomph. You feel pain. You didn't do something like, gee, I wonder what I would feel like if I had my arms crossed and was buckled over in this particular posture. You just went oomph. This looks like this guy's in pain. We experience pain even if we cause the pain in the first place. Here's a German POW being treated by an American medic. For those of us who are parents, we're really good at feeling kids' pain. In fact, we are so automatically primed for feeling pain that we're really good at feeling our pet's pain. <laughs> this is... So the question is, like, where is this happening in the brain? And the answer is it depends. For those kind of action things, they're in these regions here on the lateral surface. And for that I feel your pain kind of stuff, the, 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 the Bill Clinton line, I feel your pain, that kind of gut connection, that's happening in these other regions, particularly the dorsal anterior cingulate cortex. But this is hard to study. So how do you study it? So here's a study from Bill Horan, who'll be speaking a little bit later, in which you use a technique from EEG called mu suppression. Mu suppression is an EEG frequency, but it has this weird property. It changes based on how social something is. So if you're looking at things that change in how social they are, you will have more or less mu suppression, reduction of this frequency. So for example, if you're looking at balls bouncing, 
who cares, not social, it's a control condition. You look at a moving hand, okay, sort of, kind of social. You look at your own hand moving. You look at three people standing around, these are video clips. That's sort of social, but not very. You look at three people throwing a ball to each other, they're interacting, that's more social. On the clip now, it looks like they're throwing the ball to you. That's even more social. So what you can have is essentially a social ladder where the stimuli, these little clips, become more and more and more social. And as they become more social, you suppress more of this EEG frequency. So you have more suppression the more social it is. What about people with schizophrenia? How do they look? Exactly the same. They show the same pattern. In our hands, we don't find any differences in this affect sharing, this gut connection. This seems to be intact in schizophrenia, at least it is in the studies that we've done and in the study that Bill Haran did. So let's consider our next area, mentalizing. Mentalizing is when you get into someone else's mind. It's when you take their perspective. It's when you see things from their point of view. And so sometimes when you're just processing emotion to faces, you go, wait a minute, this doesn't look right. Kids eating ice cream are supposed to be happy. This kid looks not happy. His forehead's not cooperating with the happy view here. So what's going on? You actually have to think. You have to make an inference. You have to make guess. Sometimes faces are intentionally ambiguous in which you have to think about it. Here's a Nobel laureate with an intentionally <laughs> ambiguous face. Sometimes faces are unintentionally ambiguous. <laughs> Sometimes faces require detective work to figure out what someone else is thinking about. And sometimes you can't tell. There's just not enough information, so you have to make some inferences, and you have to gather a little more information, and then you're able to make the correct inferences about what someone else is thinking. So how do you study this? And in terms of, you can have performance tests, and again, uh, this is a performance difference area in which people with schizophrenia differ from healthy controls, but how do you study it in the scanner? Um, so, and these would be the regions that would be the core regions. There's lateral regions and there's medial regions. And so these are the regions that we want to see light up, activate, be associated with it, but it's not that easy to study. So here's a study from Jung Hee Lee from our laboratory. It gives you a sense as to how you can control for the, con the conditions that you want. You you're in the scanner, you're reading a story. John told Emily that he had a Porsche. Actually, his car is a Ford. Emily doesn't know anything about cars, though, so she believed John. When Emily sees John's car, she thinks it is, and it's not a hard question to answer, but what does it require? It requires you to suspend what you know to be true to answer the question from Emily's point of view. You need to get into Emily's mind. Contrast that. I mean, in the scanner, you literally contrast it. That's how you get a difference. Amy made a painting of a treehouse three years ago when it was blue. That was before the storm. We built a new treehouse last summer, but we painted it red instead. The treehouse in the painting is, and again, it's not a hard question to answer, but it requires you to suspend what you know to be true now and say what's true for the painting. Now, as a cognitive psychologist, I can tell you that these two situations are very similar in terms of the demands they make. They're very similar. The difference is one involves a human mind. That's the, and if you subtract these two, if you look at the activation, that's just due to having a human mind. It looks like this. You have the core mentalizing regions, and uh, with the uh, comparison group, it's very clear, and this is a reliable finding. And this is when you just take away the, um, the findings uh, of the picture example from the, um, the, the Porsche Ford example, this is what you get. You get a lot of activation. Um, the individuals with schizophrenia, they show that activation too, but they don't show it as much. So this would be an example in which we do have performance differences and also activation differences between people with schizophrenia in this kind of mental, basic uh, mentalizing function. So this is the last example of a social processing system that I'll show you. It's uh, called emotion regulation. And before I tell you about it, let me tell you about my trip here. 
So I came with my family, and we had really long lines. <laughs> we had a really crowded cabin. We had really unappetizing food. <laughs> there was this noisy kid. It, I don't think it was ours. It was uh, near us. And so the question is, how did we get through all that? How did we get through that maintaining our composure <laughs> and not lashing out at people? And the answer is we did something that you take for granted but is an immense human accomplishment. We reframed things. And I said to myself, this is only temporary. Soon I'll be in New York City and think about how beautiful that's going to be. So that's called emotion regulation and we do it all the time. So emotion regulation is when you influence which emotion is experienced, when, and how it's experienced. And the system that's used most commonly is called cognitive reappraisal. It's when you change your interpretation about uh, a stimulus, particularly a negative stimulus or a frightening stimulus. These are the regions. They involve frontal lateral regions as well as the amygdala. Um, and the question is, how do you study something like this? Well, here's an example. This is another one of Bill Haran's studies in which you'd see a boring picture, boring picture, and you read something about it. This is an edible mushroom. Now you re see a scary picture, and you read something that confirms it's scary. This is a poisonous snake that's very dangerous. Then you see a scary picture, a negative picture, in which you read something that tells you the snake is harmless. It doesn't even have teeth. And you might say, I don't care what I'm reading. That's a scary picture. But your brain isn't saying that. Your brain changed when you got that kind of information. This is emotion regulation. And you can see it in EEG. This is called a late positive potential in which the red line and the blue line are all the scary negative pictures. But the red line is the scary pictures with the accurate description or the non-regulated description. And the blue line is the same group of pictures, but with something that makes you feel less negative about it. So you can see the red line is consistently above the blue line. That means that your brain is responding to that regulation. Now, with people with schizophrenia, we don't see the red line above the blue line. It seems to be inconsistent. Um, and so we're not getting good EEG indications of this, this basic process that we really take uh, advantage of, which is how to mod modify um, the, uh, the feelings that we have, particularly negative feelings that we have. So let me sum summarize what I've said so far, which is that I've covered four examples of brain systems that handle social processing. Some of these are impaired, and this is, I gave you an example of affect sharing, which is intact, and there's other areas that are intact or relatively intact. So this is important in that you do have areas that can be the basis of intervention programs, things that work well uh, in schizophrenia. So then uh, the question is, what if you want to do something really complex like empathy? which is the sharing, understanding, and responding to unique emotional experiences of another person. This is something that's big. So where's empathy? I don't have an empathy box here. Like, where do I find it? The answer is empathy happens when systems work together. So here you have an example in which mentalizing sometimes called cognitive empathy, experience sharing sometimes called affective empathy. These work together, and when they work together, we start getting empathy. Moreover, um, you sometimes need social cue perception for empathy, and you sometimes need to be able to regulate emotion, like we talked about, modulate your emotion for empathy. So when you start talking about individual systems, like I've talked about so far, you can ask how they work together to achieve higher level functions like empathy that are more complex. And this gives us a more uh, a disciplined way to examine the social processing and the brain's uh, systems that underlie it. This is my last slide. And this, again, brings us back to the UCLA uh, uh, section in which uh, I have spoken about social cognition and the brain systems. Uh, in the next presentation, Amanda McCleary will talk about cognition 
uh, and its brain determinants. Uh, then uh, for Bill Horan and Steve Martyr, we'll be talking about how you can improve these determinants. And with this kind of figure, you can see the overall goal. The overall goal is if these are the factors, the determinants, the influences for community integration, if we can find interventions, if we can find interventions to relieve some of the difficulties here at the determinants, then you can imagine recovery-based interventions, interventions for schizophrenia that are specifically designed to improve daily functioning. This is uh, uh, our group, and I want to know, uh, note that I've commented on work from Bill Horan, Jung-Hee Lee, Amanda McCleary, Jonathan Wynn, and Steve Martyr. I'll stop here, and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Uh, questions for Dr. Green? Well, uh, let me just start out. That was a really fascinating uh, introduction to these uh, social deficits that occur in schizophrenia. And I hadn't really thought before about the whole issue of this uh, imitating uh, the affective sharing um, and the motor resonance, I think, what you call Could you say a little bit more about the difference between that in, in people who do not have schizophrenia yeah. and people who do have schizophrenia, the actual deficit? Yeah. So, um, so the question was about the, um, uh, the experience sharing or the, um, uh, the motor resonance and affect sharing. Th this is one of the areas that we're um, impressed with the lack of differences between people with schizophrenia and comparison groups, that there seems to be an intact ability to activate the parts of the brain when someone sees a movement. Because remember, when you see a movement, you activate those regions. And when you see someone, particularly the example that's usually given is if you see someone in pain, you have that automatic connection to that. That's an area in which we simply don't see differences between people with schizophrenia and, and healthy controls. It seems to be an area that's intact. And uh, it's consistent with the findings that um, Individuals with schizophrenia are able to enjoy things as much as anyone else. They might not look forward to things as much, but so that in the presence, they, 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 can, they can enjoy it. Okay, so we got a, a bunch of questions. Let's go over here. Uh, yes, Dr. Green, uh, you spoke about different behaviors with people with schizophrenia and origins, uh, places in the brain where they may reside some of these deficiencies. Are there any um, medications that can target these uh, deficiencies. Um, so um, you're you're going to you're going to hear from Dr. Martyr and fr uh, from uh, Dr. Haran uh, a training intervention to target these deficiencies, and in particular, you'll talk you'll hear from Dr. Martyr the idea of combining uh, a medication with the training, uh, so that you can get sort of added oomph from the training. So I'm reluctant to say too much about it because you're going to get a, 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 a better story in the combination of Dr. Martyrs and Haran's presentation. So be patient. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Yes, ma'am. Some of what you said reminded me of the notion of, motor nor of mirror neurons. Okay. Are they involved? Yeah. yeah. Um, so the, the question was about mirror, mirror neurons, and um, you'll notice I didn't use the term. Um, it, it actually is the same as the motor resonance system. The, um, so it is the same thing. Uh, in the popular press, motor neurons take on a sort of broader role than what we um, understand them to be. The, the, uh, the question is actually, there are neurons, and they were discovered in monkeys, in which when they s see a movement, the neuron actually activates. Again, it's in the same region where if the monkey were to activate the movement uh, itself. Um, those are the same as the motor resonance system. Uh, in humans, of course, we don't record from neurons, so we talk about things like the motor neuron system, but they seem to be roughly in the same regions as they are uh, uh, in the analogous regions in the monkey. So you can think for most purposes the motor resonance system is the equivalent of a mirror neuron system. It's a, it's a, it's a good question. Okay, over here. Yes, sir. 
You mentioned empathy. empathy, empathy. Um, with, with, with people with schizophrenia, if there's long-term therapy that focuses on getting out of a paranoid state and becoming more empathetic, is that restorative and does that actually change the neurochemistry in a protective way with someone with oh. schizophrenia? Oh, that is... Um, so, you, you, you'll, you'll get part, part of an answer in the later presentations, which is that we can improve uh, empathy to an extent, we can improve perspective taking to an extent, and you're going to hear again for Dr. Martyr and Haran on that. Your question is, does that change the brain? So, um, uh, Jung Hee Lee just finished an uh, fMRI study that was uh, added to one of our training programs. And so in some of the, um, in some of the activity, for example, with perspective taking, uh, she did show brain changes with fMRI. But I, I should caution you, whereas there's been a lot of work on how to develop these programs, there's only been a small amount of work where there's fMRI added to these studies. But the data that we got from our lab is really encouraging that the behavioral changes that they see, tr that you see translate into activation changes at the level of the brain. So, uh, with schizophrenia, uh, you're showing that there are parts of the brain that just don't seem to be functioning. And is there some kind of a correlation between what goes on with some people that have multiple sclerosis that have lesions in their brain that mm. interfere? Um, I had read an article in the Times a couple months ago that they are beginning to see the correlations of the lesions, not necessarily yeah. um, a correlation between the multiple sclerosis and the schizophrenia, although I think that there might be. Um, you know, the, with the multiple sclerosis, they don't have the uh, connections, the uh, coverings on yeah. the neurons, and is it a similarity with the schizophrenia? Um, so, uh, we, the short answer is we don't know very much. Um, the, the primary difference with uh, multiple sclerosis is that the lesions are discrete, whereas in um, uh, schizophrenia, whatever is going on is probably um, milder and more diffuse. Um, but your point's correct, which is that even though the problem might be milder and more diffuse, we do believe that some systems are affected more than others. But most people would say that that's a different kind of problem to have than something with MS in which you have sort of the, these uh, more specific problems uh, that, are, that are sort of within small regions. So the answer is I, I don't know of much work on those kind of direct correlations, and it seems like it's a different kind of illness model for the most part. Thank you. Thank you.